On this, the June 20th, 2023 edition of What's Going On with Shipping, we update on the submersible Titan diving on the Titanic and talk about safety of life at sea. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. So a lot of updates coming in. The most recent update has from the U.S. Coast Guard, the first Coast Guard district in Boston, are talking about the fact that there are 40 hours of air remaining in the submersible, assuming the submersible is intact, uh, based on their dive. And the search will continue, by the way. You will continue the search until all parameters are exhausted, till you know the the passenger's crew can no longer survive. So you have to treat this as a rescue operation at this point. Uh, I'm not going to give you an update on the rescue because you can tune in to uh, news sources. Uh, You can go to the BBC, Fox News, CNN, whatever source you want to use and get that up to date a lot faster than I'm doing. I want to talk about the relationship of this mini sub, this submersible and how it operates, and what are some issues regarding it, particularly the issue of safety of life at sea, because of all things, Titanic is most well known for, not the movie, it is known for establishing the safety preventions and safety protocols, how ships operate. Uh, Literally two years after the sinking of Titanic in January of 1914, a convention was held in London, and a treaty was ratified called the Safety of Life at Sea, SOLAS. And that treaty and convention is the regulatory body that exists today to ensure that ships operating on the high seas follow minimum standards and protocols. The problem is that this is a submersible and not a ship and therefore did not fall under SOLAS. And we may actually see something come out of this because of that. But getting ahead of myself, let's talk about the situation here. So we know that the Polar Prince and other assets are in the area. That is Polar Prince registered in Canada. The vessel sailed from Canada. So Canada is going to be the one that's going to have a lot of issues coming out of this, I would argue. Even though OceanGate is an American company, uh, it's based out of Everett, Washington. The ship they launched from and the port they exited from St. John's is all in Canada. So this is going to be an issue here that we're going to get back to in a second. So three things could have happened to the submersible. Number one, the worst case scenario is that the pressure vessel collapsed, imploded, in which case there is no survivors. And let's be clear, pressure vessels are really dangerous. When you start exerting pressure on the outside of vessels and there are pressure differentials, Uh, you can have catastrophic results. Uh, I I can remember a Mythbusters episode where they pulled a negative vacuum in a tanker truck, a metal tanker truck, and tried to see if outside air pressure, 14.7 PSI pressure, could collapse it. And initially it didn't because the sphere was perfect and, and it was undamaged, nothing happened. But once they dropped a weight on it and put a dent in it, it collapsed. A steel tanker truck collapsed from just normal air pressure you're dealing with pressures 380 times normal air pressure or, or pressure at the depths of 3,800 meters, 13,000 feet. This is an insane depth. And when something goes wrong, there's very margin of error here. All right, that's the worst case. Uh, scenario number one. Uh, scenario number two is they descended down. They were about an hour and 45 minutes into their two and a half hour dive. They experienced a communication problem, in which case they shed their weights. They dropped their weights, which are pulling them down to the bottom of the ocean, in which case they pop to the surface. Now, you don't have to worry about bends or anything like that because they're, they're in normal air pressure. They don't have outside pressure acting on them. That's where you get the bends, nitrogen in the system. They would pop to the surface. Now you're in a minivan sized object floating in the Atlantic. And let me be clear, it's a carbon fiber, uh, titanium uh, alloy, very difficult to detect. And this is one of the reasons why you see ships and airplanes scouring the area, because if they have popped to the surface and don't have communications, they are a tiny speck on the ocean, very hard to find. They are basically hatched in this thing. The the hatch to put them in, 17 bolts, is sealed from the outside. So there's no hatch you pop and get out. And if there's no communications, they're sitting there bobbing around on the surface, very difficult to find. The third scenario is lost power, weights on them, they descended to the bottom and they hit bottom, 13,000 feet down. Uh, Probably not in the Titanic. Titanic is a very small speck at the bottom of the ocean and plus they probably didn't descend right on Titanic. This 
based on stories I've heard, they've had a hard time locating Titanic at different times. So very unlikely they're on Titanic. They're probably just on the bottom. But if they're on the bottom, they're at 13,800 feet. And this is a extreme depth. So one of the things that you're hearing about that they're using here is sonar. So think about the classic sonar image you have from World War II. This is the Titan. Again, very small. This kind of tube uh, cylinder here. And don't look at these bolts. This is the outside that's, that's kind of encased around the sphere. That is not what it is. It's, a, it's, it's an alloy composite sphered in. And then this front end is bolted on. But this is a really small object to find. And when you start using sonar, sonar, you know, the military sonar that's being used, whether it being from ship or from airplanes dropping sonar buoys, there's two types of sonar they're using. They're using passive where they're listening, in which case they would want to hear something from the submarine. But again, this has no propulsion system except for thrusters. And if they lost power, there's no thrusters working. So this is the point where you want to have a wrench banging on metal. But again, this is a composite metal. I'm not exactly sure they even have a wrench to sound signals in it. Plus, they're going to be at the deepest part of the ocean or they're in the turbulence on the surface, in which case sonar doesn't work very well. Sonar works great when you're above it. But when, as the deeper something goes, sonar actually bends uh, because of water and salinity and a whole batch of factors. Sonar bends. And so it will actually have a hard time, unless you're right above something, hearing something, which makes sonar very difficult to use passively. Active sonar is what you hear in every World War II movie, that ping sound that goes out. But again, most military submarines today operate above 1,000 feet of water. They're, they, they don't go deeper than 1,000. It's all classified and crud like that. So you're about 300 meters to 1,000. If Titan's at the bottom, they're at 13,200 feet of water over 3,800 meters. Sonar doesn't typically work down that deep. And if it does, you gotta be very narrowed focus in directing it. So sonar becomes a really big problem. The other type of sonar you have is called side scan sonar. This is the sonar that maps the ocean bottom, but to find something the size of a minivan on the ocean bottom, is really tough. Plus it takes a long time. It's a very narrow field you look at. You basically have to mow the grass back and forth and sweep an area to do this. And it takes a long time to do it. And again, they've down to 40 hours of air. So the, the potential here of finding them at the bottom is very difficult. Add to it that even if they do locate them at the bottom, what do they do? How do you bring them up? Because now you're at 13,800 feet. It's not as simple as hook a cable onto them and hoist them up. Well, okay, well, you know, my winch can hoist this uh, vessel up. We know that the, the hoist on the Polar Prince can hoist that vessel up, but can it hoist that vessel plus 13,800 feet of cable? That's the problem you have. And not only that, you have to get the cable to it. You got to secure it. Uh, this, this turns into a really big problem. And there's a lot of videos floating around. I'm going to link to some videos in the video here for you to look at of a CBS correspondent who went on this expedition last year and also uh, some commentary from some people within the firm who are now talking about the fact that the government is holding up rescue coming in. I, I, I have a little bit of a problem with that because I, I, I doubt that. I also want to know what type of rescue vehicles are en route here because I said before, there's very few vehicles that operate at this depth. But what, the thing I want to talk about here today is the regulation of this submersible. So a uh, buddy of mine, John Scott Ralton, posted this on Twitter, which he pulled off the Ocean Gate website and highlighted it. So I want to talk a little bit about this because this submersible is operating outside the bounds of normal ships. It is not a ship. It is not flagged. And therefore, it is not falling under what we would call SOLAS, the safety of life at sea. And as they talk about in this here, that most major marine operators require the chartered vessels are classed by an independent group, ABS, DNV, Lloyds, one of the big groups do this. And what is interesting about what OceanGate has done is they don't have this vessel classed. And what they say here is at the bottom, the vast majority of marine and aviation accidents are a result of operator error, not mechanical failure. As a result, simply, simply focusing on classing the vessel does not address the operational risk. Maintaining high level operational safety requires constant committed uh, effort and a focused corporate culture. Two things that OceanGate takes very seriously and that are not 
assessed during classification. While that is true, you still do have mechanical failures. And what this is telling me is that there is not an outside agency that is checking them. If you go on here and read this, while classing agencies are willing to pursue the certification of new innovative designs and ideas, they often have a multi-year approval cycle due to lack of pre-existing standards, especially. So the owner of OceanGate talked about the long, laborious process of going through this. And so what you see here is them doing something different. As a result, simply focusing on classing the vessel does not address the operational risks. And so OceanGate is operating these vessels without a classification society. They're basically, they're not flying a flag. And so when you have a ship that sails between ports, it has to be registered in the country. I've talked about a lot on this channel, ships being registered in Panama, Liberia, the Marshall Islands. Well, those are classification, those are, those are registries. And the registry sets standards. And under international law, when you sail a vessel into a port through what's called a port state control agreement, agencies can go on board to ensure those vessels are meeting the standard. So when a Liberian vessel sails into New York, the U.S. Coast Guard can go on board and ensure that vessel is meeting the requirements of the Safety of Life at Sea Convention, for example. And you do that on a normal basis. The submersible Titan isn't flagged or registered anywhere. It's akin to basically putting a boat on a trailer. If you put a boat on a trailer and you're driving down a highway and you get stopped by the police, the police will ensure that your trailer is registered, that your trailer meets all the qualifications, but they don't inspect the boat. The boat's not their jurisdiction. They, they really don't care about the boat so much. The only, the only people who care about the boat is the Coast Guard when you put the boat in the water, but they're worried about this. And that's what we're seeing right now. The Polar Prince, which is a Canadian flag vessel, will be inspected when it goes in the port to make sure it meets safety registration and safety features. There'll be a third party uh, entity that comes on board, Lloyd's, ABS, DNV, but that's not the case of the, of the Titan. And so what you're seeing here is this, where no other submersible, you currently utilize real time monitoring to monitor hull health during a dive, classified subs are only required to undergo depth validation every th three years, whereas our RTM system validates the integrity of the hull on each and every dive. Okay, you're monitoring the hull on each and every dive, but where's that outside agency that's really ensuring that there's no problems that you are missing on this? And this is where you got the SOLAS agreement. Understand when Titanic sank in 1912, everybody knew the issues. Everybody knew that Titanic didn't have enough lifeboats for everybody on board. That wasn't a surprise. And understand, it met the rules. The British Ministry of Trade set, or British Board of Trade, set the standard by how many lifeboats they're supposed to have. Because no one ever envisioned that everyone would have to get off the Titanic at the same time. What they envisioned is that if there was a problem, they would use the lifeboats to ferry people to other vessels. That's what they were there for. Well, that's not what happened, as we all know. Add to it, you had other issues. You had rockets being fired, flares being fired that were not recognized as distress flares because there was no standard for it. You had on board Titanic a telegraph system, the Marconi system. Well, that was not being monitored by all vessels in the area, which meant that even though the California was close by, they did not get it. Now, after Titanic, you had to have 24-hour watch. You had to have an automated system that would trigger an alarm on board. We got a whole series of issues that came out of Titanic, and they're known as SOLAS, the safety of life at sea, which has been renewed multiple times in 1929, in 1948, in 1960, and then once again in 1974. That is the current agreement that's in place. So Titanic sets the standard by which we operate vessels. Everything from the ice patrol to public address systems, to lifeboat designs, immersion suits, uh, evacuation suits, uh, helicopter rescues, uh, you name it, are all done as a result of what happened with Titanic. And one of the most important things that we've seen develop is this idea of an emergency beacon that can be released. So all ships are fitted with what's called an EPIRB, an emergency position indicating radio beacon. When the ship goes down, this floats free and, and beeps off. Actually, the most modern version of Apple phones have a very similar feature built into them that send off this emergency distress beacon. 
And all vessels are fitted with them. Additionally, vessels have a kind of a black box, very much like aircraft, where you have what's called the vessel data recorder. Those VDRs have beacons on board so that when they go down with the ship, they emit a beacon so that you can home in on it. It is not clear that OceanGate installed a beacon on board this vessel because after a set period of time, this Titan should have a beacon that will trip off and you would be able to home in on it. And that is not indicating right now. There's no indication of any sound coming or a beacon coming that you can follow. Now, they're not foolproof. They get damaged and they, they won't go off. We saw that happen, for example, with El Faro when the El Faro sunk uh, back in um, uh, 2016. We saw that happen. But here, there's really no requirement for that. And so submersibles, which operate in this really gray area, because they're not ships, they're not flagged, and they only operate out in deep water, typically, are really outside the confines of Solus. And whereas Titanic sinking brought us Solus 1914, I think Titan may bring a Solus 2023 where we start seeing some regulation for submersibles. We're seeing the same issue right now in space travel with SpaceX and the like, how they're operating in these new areas where regulations don't typically exist. And now we're seeing that with submersibles. Unfortunately for the five people on board here, it's beginning to look not good. Now you continue the rescue. You are optimistic. I'm a firefighter. I listen, you, you keep searching until there's no hope. Uh, this is a rescue operation. But once you reach a point, there'll be considerations to take into effect. Remember, they're going on the basis of air. If they're sitting at the bottom right now, that's cold temperatures. If they've lost a heater, they're going to get cold down there. It's almost freezing at that depth. You've got water and food issues too on board. Uh, this becomes really dangerous down at that depth. And so you still continue to see this as a rescue. The best hope for them is that they've popped to the surface and they have not been located yet. Uh, this is a very, very depressing story, I have to tell you. But it's really important that we talk about these things because out of Titanic came a lot of the rules and regulations that allowed us to have a much safer ocean shipping. Undersea, underwater is becoming much more commonplace. You know, we saw this with aviation in the early 20th century. We're seeing it with space travel and deep sea in the early 21st century. And a lot of the problems we saw with aviation in the early 20th century helped make changes that make aviation much safer today, seeing the same thing with space travel and deep water. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I know it's not a great topic. I apologize, but thought it was really important to talk about this. Uh, if you enjoyed the channel, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos. As they come out, leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. You can hit the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon and become a patron of the page. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off.